So therefore, you know, I would like to um, point only one thing, that due to what happened with Crimea and the subsequent militarization of Crimea, the entire landscape, security landscape in the Black Sea has been changed. And now the problem is how to continue to exploit the economic and commercial advantages of the Black Sea with an important military dimension added to it is probably the equation which everyone has to solve. Now, without further ado, I will, uh, I will uh, invite uh, Mr. Asaf Hajiev, who is the Secretary General of, uh, of PAPSEC, to uh, start the discussion. You have the floor, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ioan Mircea Pashku, Vice President of <laughs> European Parliament, distinguished audience, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to congratulate Bulgarian presidency in EU and to wish success in their activity. It is high honor and privilege for me to address such a distinguished audience and express my deep gratitude to Mrs. Gemma Grozdanova, the chairperson of the Foreign Affairs Committee, and to Mr. Konstantin Popov, the chairperson of the Defense Committee of the National Assembly of Republic Bulgaria for inviting me to take part in this meeting on behalf of PAPSEC. I present PAPSEC, this organization which was established in 1993 and today is composed 76 MPs from 12 member states of Black, Black Sea Economic Cooperation and among them three EU country and five country participate in the Eastern Partnership, Partnership Program. The Assembly represents a unique political forum of interparliamentary dialogue in the Black Sea region and its main objectives are to achieve a high degree of regional economic cooperation and to transform the Black Sea region into a zone of peace, stability in, and prosperity. In the world politics, Black Sea region plays an important role. There are several reasons. First, it is a bridge between Europe and Asia. Asia is a huge market, and this market needs European technologies and achievement, and I think it is necessary to use this opportunity because it will be profitable for both sides, for the European Union as well for Asia. Second, the uh, Black Sea region is situated at the crossroad of major transportation roads from east to west. I mean, Silk Road, and from the north to the south, Viking Road. And the third, at the same time, this region is rich in energy resources and in important energy roads from Central Asia and Caspian region representing an outstanding source of oil and gas for the world market. Today, oil and gas are transported from the Black Sea region to the world market. There exist already several pipelines, and one of the most important is Baku Belisi Jehan. Under the construction, there are two gas pipelines, TAP and TANAP, and gas from Caspian Sea, Chardonnay II, will be delivered to the European Union market, first of all to Italy, Greece, and Bulgaria. The World Bank already gave amount two billion US dollar for achievement of this project, which will be part of continuation of South Gas Corridor. It will be continuation of the current existing, I mean, uh, gas pipeline, Baku Tbilisi Airs Room, and gas will be delivered to European Union market. The opening of the railway connection with Baku Tbilisi cars has recently marked an important step in establishing a fracht and passenger link between Europe and China. But despite, despite this, the most important value of the Black Sea, not energy, not transportation road, but people who live in this region, different nations with different religions, 
with different culture and different traditions. And it is, it is a value of Black Sea region. But unfortunately, I have to underline that the world economy, unfortunately the last year the Black Sea region and Europe in general have faced a serious threat, mainly the refugees problem. The world economy has already been damaged by more than 4 billion US dollar. You can imagine that it's a 3% of European Union GDP. And as a matter of that fact, terrorism will leave approximately 65 million refugees around the world. Have a look to statistics. Today in the world, among, among of 110 people, there is ex at least one refugee. But in the, if we will come to Black Sea region, this digit it is much more higher. Among of 60 people, there is one refugee. But if you will come to some country of Black Sea region, for instance, Azerbaijan, there is a monk of nine people, one refugees. Some of them, the, these have fled war or terror, while others have been born into displacement and know no other life than that of being a refugee. That is why urgent active efforts should be made by the international community to overcome the resistance of the forces which disturb the normal lives of people. Only Turkey last year received three million refugees and they spent already for this around 10 billion US dollar. Unfortunately, the Black Sea region is faced with another very serious problem which have a negative impact on the development of our region. Our organization includes only 12 member countries, and today we have eight unsolved conflicts among of them, which affect the regional economic development. They have to be solved in the near future since they entail the innocent people's suffering. And you can imagine which battle we have during our assembly or committee, because you know, but eight countries for 12 countries, I think it's too much. But we are economical organization and we are trying to keep uh, balance. The conflict have different reasons. Hence, it's necessary to approach each conflict in a specific way. And in this regard, I'd like to remind very famous words of the great Russian writer Tolstoy, who underlined, all happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. But there should be, but despite of this, there should be one main principle for finding solution for these conflicts. According to the international principles, such as decision and resolution of United Nations and other international organizations, where the principle of territorial integrity should have the precedence. Strengthening the cooperation and the good neighborly relation is a condition for ensuring peace and stability, not only in our region and in Europe, but worldwide. In this respect, it's important to consolidate the cooperation among parliaments and also among of interparliamentary assemblies belonging to different regions of the world. Our assembly is open for cooperation with other interparliamentary assemblies, not only from Europe, but from the whole world with which it shares common values and interests. Dear colleagues, energy security, cyber security, terrorism, conflicts, and so on, a lot of problems in front of us, a lot of challenges. And the question is what we have to do. The best answer to this question concerning the ways and methods we must follow in order to overcome today's challenges was given more than 200 years ago by the famous German poet and philosopher Goethe, who said, the weaks should be united to be stronger, but the strong ones should be united to be invincible. And so it is necessary tonight all our effort to be invisible. History showed that confrontation yields to nothing positive for the world. And in this respect, 
the Black Sea should not divide, but unite all of us. And finally, I would like to say a few words, you know. I was born in the big country, huge country, I would say. But that country does not exist anymore. It was Soviet Union. But during Soviet time, I thought that the world is huge because it was very difficult to leave Soviet country. It was regime country. But after collapse of Soviet Union, when borders have been opened, I saw that we live not in a huge world. We live in a small world. But in the end of 20th century, international uh, information and communication technology came in to our life, and I understood that the world is not huge, even world not small. We live in a microscopic world, and where is our obligation in front of new generation is to bring peace, reconciliation, and prosperity for nations. I wish to everybody success and prosperity. Thank you for kind attention. Thank you very, Thank you very much, Mr. Yeah. Secretary General. I was only wondering who is looking at us from the other end of the microscope. <laughs> so uh, I'm inviting now my friend, old friend, Mr. Ivailo Kalfin, who is the special counselor of uh, Commissioner uh, Oettinger. He was, as you know, former Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs of uh, Bulgaria and also colleague in the European Parliament. So, Ivailo, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Jan. Uh, you started with the color of the Black Sea, that it's uh, going to remain black. Uh, there is a, I don't know whether this is the truth, but there is a legend here in Bulgaria that the name Black Sea comes because of the many casualties uh, we had in the Black Sea at the time when it was very intensively used for commerce, for uh, any type of uh, communication. Uh, so the black comes not from some romantic uh, 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 origin, but uh, this is very much related to, to casualties. At that time, very much uh, uh, due to uh, natural disasters, but uh, now I'm afraid that uh, not that we control better the nature, but uh, the humanity is uh, able to create much bigger disasters than, than, than the nature creates. So the Black Sea region is a very important region also for the for the European Union, because not only because it's on the shores of the, of the European Union, uh, but because uh, the Black Sea uh, kind of focuses relations with uh, very different types of partners and stakeholders. Uh, you have the relations with Russia, you have the relations with Turkey, uh, you have the relations with uh, countries uh, uh, from former Soviet Union aspiring to uh, one day join in a form the European Union. You have uh, uh, Caucasus countries. I mean, we should accept a wider uh, understanding of, uh, of the Black Sea. Uh, Caucasus countries with uh, their uh, particular relations, not necessarily aspiring for EU membership, but with the need to increase the cooperation. And the Secretary General of uh, PAPSEC uh, mentioned some very good reasons why the Black Sea is uh, this focal point uh, and why it's creating all this, uh, this figure. So if you try to approach the Black Sea, you need to take into consideration all these uh, uh, layers of different uh, different interests and different types of, uh, of, uh, of, of relations. Um, for example, again, the frozen conflicts were mentioned. Uh, yes, we, indeed, we have eight frozen conflicts, and if uh, I could use some statistical terminology, the correlation coefficient is close to one of uh, the changing of the status quo with the appearance of a new frozen conflict. Uh, and the recent examples, uh, I, I'm not sure that we can uh, call Crimea a frozen conflict or, or what is happening in the eastern part of Ukraine, uh, but uh, this was the consequence of uh, uh, an attempt of Ukraine to change uh, the cap and uh, the very strong desire of the European Union to sign a cooperation agreement with, uh, with Ukraine. The previous uh, uh, case was uh, back in 2008, 10 years ago, uh, when some members of NATO were pressing very much to provide what is called membership action plan to Georgia and Ukraine. Uh, 
There was a debate in NATO. I was sitting on the Council of Foreign Ministers at that time. Uh, there were very different opinions. Uh, the result was uh, what is today Georgia. Uh, and, uh, 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 and what happened back in 2008. I could go back in history. But you are going to see that this is very much related. Once somebody tries to change the status quo around Russia, uh, immediately you have another conflict appearing uh, somewhere, uh, keeping the instability. I would say that everybody has the interest to have, we, we all want stability, security, peace in the Black Sea. The problem is that uh, maybe the different uh, players see the stability in a different way. Uh, maybe in some cases, or for some of them, instability is better than a stable situation, but not in their interest. Uh, and these conflicts and these different opinions are very far from being solved. Um, given the current relations with Russia, given with what is happening in Turkey now, and the very complicated relations between the European Union and Turkey. Uh, by the way, end of March, there will be a meeting uh, that uh, Bulgaria is going to host uh, between the leaders of the European Union and Turkey, and the Turkish leaders. There are plenty of issues to be solved, but uh, uh, in long term, uh, I don't see a situation now to, to, to solve all these, uh, these problems. What the European Union should do in this situation? Uh, uh, apparently not to ignore the Black Sea region. Uh, not that it is not possible. Of course, it's possible to put it as a very low priority uh, and just not to interfere in what is happening there. Uh, but I'm not sure that this is going to be in the interest of, uh, of the European Union. Why? Because the Black Sea theoretically could be an extremely high asset if it is used properly for energy, for transportation, for communications. Uh, now the whole traffic between Europe and Asia, if it is uh, terrestrial, goes either through Turkey, which is overloaded with energy projects, and we keep putting more and more energy uh, projects through Turkey, or through Russia and uh, uh, the problematic regions uh, and uh, with their problematic relations with Ukraine and, uh, and some other countries in the, in the region. So if we want a straighter line, it goes definitely through the Black Sea. Um, the Black Sea has its own problems. Uh, recently, with this uh, uh, anti-plastic strategy of the European Commission, recently I've read and I was even surprised that the Black Sea is the most polluted with plastics. So you have environmental uh, issues there, you have energy issues, you have transportation issues, you have security issues. Um, fortunately, uh, I think, we have the Montreal Convention. This is a convention which uh, has been signed uh, uh, around 100 years ago, which uh, regulates the entry of military uh, vessels uh, to the Black Sea. Um, and this convention is kind of retaining maybe the, the military tension in the Black Sea. But there are new plans. For example, Turkey is planning to bypass the Bosphorus with a new strait there. Uh, so what is going to happen? Then the Black Sea is going to be either open or you are going to have the choice between the Bosphorus and the Turkish uh, straight. This is going to change also the security situation in the Black Sea, and this is not a very distant future. The European Union has, a, I would say, not a very coherent approach uh, to this region. And uh, I would uh, focus the rest of my uh, initial intervention uh, to, to, to the structure, uh, the institutional structure that the European Union has chosen to deal with the Black Sea region. Uh, we have several types of policies that are overlapping, sometimes they're not completing each other. We have the Black Sea Synergy. Uh, it has been launched uh, back in 2007. Uh, uh, note that this is the year when Bulgaria and Romania joined the European Union and the Black Sea became a shore sea of the, of the European Union. And this was an initiative we have been working uh, very much with, uh, uh, with uh, the Romanian authorities, uh, the Romanian government and the German presidency at that time. Uh, in order to provide a platform for cooperation of the European Union with all the countries, all the stakeholders in the Black Sea. It has been launched, but meanwhile, 
in the European Union, and I was again a direct witness to that, there was a debate, uh, do we need some Black Sea synergy if uh, EU member countries that have nothing to do with the Black Sea are to communicate, for example, with Ukraine or Moldova or another country. Then this was the reason that uh, another policy appeared immediately after the Black Sea synergy, and this is the Eastern Partnership. The difference is that uh, the Black Sea synergy is a platform, for cooperation with everybody. The Eastern Partnership is a platform for, for cooperation with six countries, excluding Russia and Turkey, because of different reasons. I mean, the approach was that these are eventually the prospective, one day, maybe members of the, of the European Union. That created quite a lot of resistance, mainly first coming from Russia. And everything which has be, can be done and uh, qualified as Russian influence in the region. Uh, the money, actually the funds, were committed to this policy, to the Eastern Partnership. There was an attempt to try to uh, institutionalize it with some parliamentary assembly, etc., etc. The parliamentary assembly had a huge problem to launch its existence because there was a huge question how the Lukashenko's uh, uh, members of uh, the Belarus parliament are going to, to, to be present to this democratic forum, etc., etc. This is the way to create an organization which is selective first and second to try to make it a platform against some of the other countries, in this case uh, very often again Russia. Of course we had a counter action that uh, came uh, from Russia trying to block everything which is there. By the way, in the Black Sea you are going to see a very interesting long-term and strange cooperation between Russia and Turkey, including in military terms. Um, Turkey is a member of NATO, long time a member of NATO, uh, and uh, Russia has very good relations and very often very common positions with Turkey in terms of security in the Black Sea. So uh, to adopt an approach that you are anti-somebody in this region, whether you like them or you don't like them, is not very productive, I would be mild here. On the top of that, we have the neighborhood policy, of course, which is uh, the same policy for the southern and for the eastern members, of course, of course there are some differentiations, but uh, we can understand that the uh, Mediterranean and the countries that are in the Mediterranean, they, they're the own problems of the Union for the Mediterranean, and it's very difficult to transfer them to the, to the Black Sea. And again, in the Black Sea you have uh, countries that uh, want to join one day the European Union, countries that never wish to join the European Union, and large powers that uh, the relations have uh, geostrategic importance. So with these approaches of the European Union, with the neighborhood policy uh, superposed by the Eastern Partnership and the Black Sea Synergy, I'm not sure that we have the coherent approach that we should have. And the approach has to be inclusive. We need to have everybody in this dialogue. Again, it might not be on necessarily on the very sensitive issues. I mean, this is not replacing the EU-Russia dialogue or EU-Turkey dialogue, for example. But we need to create common platform for issues that are important for us. Again, energy, transportation, people-to-people -people contact, environment, anti-terrorism. These are issues that we could find common platform without being exclusive. And I think that uh, if we want to be more efficient in the region, uh, that's the way to, uh, to, to further uh, shape our policies. Thank you. Now uh, I would like to invite Mr. Thomas Meyer-Hartning, who is responsible in, uh, in uh, uh, European External Action Service exactly of uh, this area, uh, Europe and uh, Central Asia. So you have been presented, you've participated in the earlier session, and now you have the floor for this session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I ask for your forbearance to come back a second time uh, in the framework of this, uh, uh, this very important conference. But I would, in fact, like to start by linking up to something I said in the earlier session, which was that each enlargement of the European Union has uh, been able to enrich the regional out outlook and the regional perspectives of the European Union. It started 
as we know with the enlargement of 72 and uh, the United Kingdom at the time. Uh, it continued with the Spanish enlargement, which opened up new dimensions uh, for our internal uh, relations. And obviously, uh, the more recent enlargements had an effect on our relations to the north, uh, to Central and Eastern Europe at the time, to the Balkans, and of course also, as Minister Kalfin has just said, uh, to the region of the Black Sea. And it is obviously no coincidence that both both the Black Sea Synergy Initiative and our observer status uh, to BSEC came precisely at the time when Romania and Bulgaria uh, joined uh, the European Union. And the point about <coughs> this is that every new member brings a special regional uh, expertise uh, to our work, but the neighbors of our neighbors then also become our neighbors. And I think that is one of the enriching aspects of the, uh, of also of the Black Sea dimension uh, to which uh, uh, Romania and Bulgaria so greatly contributed. But others have also already said that obviously what happened more or less immediately afterwards didn't make uh, reaching out to that region easier. Uh, you have already referred, Minister Kalfin, to the uh, war in Georgia. Um, we had protracted conflicts in particular uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan already before uh, we even opened our eyes to the region and evidently what happened in 2014 and since has complicated uh, the situation even further. The illegal annexation of Crimea has had a lasting effect on the possibility of the European Union to engage in the region because as we do not recognize this annexation and will not recognize it, it obviously limits our possibility of action in important parts of the Black Sea region and the destabilization of eastern Ukraine has obviously also uh, complicated relations between participants of the uh, Black Sea cooperation that we have greatly. Now, when it comes to my contribution to this discussion, I, re I originally wanted to focus primarily on what under such limiting circumstances, uh, the European Union and partners in the region can do to at least have some multilateral cooperation between everyone in the Black Sea region. And therefore, I did in fact want to uh, focus on the possibilities and limitations in particular of the Black Sea Synergy Initiative. But following uh, what Minister Kalfin has said, I feel I also need to say something on the Eastern Partnership and other uh, forms of cooperation that we have in the region. It is true that when we started out with the Black Sea Synergy Initiative, the idea was uh, to create, st to contribute to stability and prosperity in the entire region. And obviously this has become more complicated for all the reasons I have said. There was also the idea idea to complement what is done in other formats in the region, and I'll come back to that. And we also spoke from the very outstart of the possibility of a bottom-up approach. And that is precisely uh, what we still can do, in my opinion, uh, in uh, the region. We have all sorts of practical projects uh, in the region in areas where we have been able to consolidate progress in our cooperation, where cooperation remains possible and is useful. These are not grand designs, but it's things like marine research, research innovation, maritime policies, fisheries, the, I mean, you spoke about the Black Sea and its color, but we also speak about blue growth in this context. We speak about protection of fisheries. These, is some, these are things that we can do together, and we also have, I think, quite useful formats, uh, and you know more uh, about it than many others uh, in the field of NGO cooperation, cooperation with civil society. This also fits it's into what we still can do, including in our complex uh, uh, relations with Russia. It is true that when we started out with the Black Sea Synergy Initiative, we had one candidate country, we had one strategic partner, as we called it at the time, Russia, and we also had uh, increasingly the six uh, Eastern uh, partners who also uh, form part of this region. Obviously, for all the reason that you know, uh, we are not pursuing and we cannot pursue today uh, what we used to call the strategic partnership with Russia, but we are following a policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia on the basis of the five guiding principles the European Union has agreed on in its relationship 
relation with Russia, and that includes selective engagement in areas where this is in the shared interest of both Russia and the European Union. And clearly, cooperating in a regional context, especially in dimensions that are of direct concern to people and for people-to-people -people contacts is an area where we continue to cooperate and we've done it in the past years increasingly in the northern <coughs> dimension because what we do there does not only have an impact on our relations with Russia but on the environmental situation of our own members and the same thing is obviously true in the Black Sea dimension. So I do think that selective engagement in this field remains possible. There are also some concrete positive elements that we've developed under the Black Sea Synergy. Let me give you three examples. A program of improving environmental monitoring in the Black Sea that we launched in 2013. The Black Sea Cross-Border Cooperation Program, a successful program that has a budget of 44 million, nearly 50 million euro for the period 2014 to 20. 20, and I already referred to civil society as an important stakeholder in the region, and the Black Sea NGO Forum aims at creating and consolidating an open space for debate, sharing mutual knowledge, understanding, communication, etc. And it is true that in parts of the region it is obviously easier to have this kind of dialogue with NGOs than with governmental uh, representatives. This being said, it is of course also important that everything we do in the Black Sea a Synergy Initiative is complementary and compatible with, with what we do in the other formats of cooperation in the region. And I do have to say, you won't be surprised that my vision of what we're doing in the Eastern Partnership uh, doesn't square completely with what Minister Kalfin just said uh, on the subject. First of all, we do not believe that this is an offer of cooperation that, chooses, that forces our partners to choose between us and others. What we offered to the most advanced partners in the Eastern Partnership uh, is uh, deep and comprehensive free trade, which in our opinion is fully compatible with free trade arrangements these countries could have with third partners and had in the framework also of the Commonwealth of Independent States. So it was not choosing between one and the other, and it was rather, if I may say so, uh, the Russian Federation by creating a customs zone, a customs uh, uh, union in the framework of the Eurasian Economic Union that forced some of these Eastern partners to choose in a way that we never forced these partners to choose uh, between them and us, if you may use it in these terms. And we've just shown recently, by the way, in the agreement that we have already successfully uh, negotiated and concluded with Armenia that we're able uh, to construct uh, contractual relationships uh, with Eastern partners that are fully compatible uh, with the arrangements that these uh, partners have as members of the Eurasian Economic Union. And as you also know, we are negotiating a comprehensive agreement with Azerbaijan right now, which will again be taken tailor-made in the way uh, these agreements can be. Because the point is that the three uh, most, if you want, the, most, the three most ambitious Eastern partners are seeking a relationship of approximation uh, with, the with the internal market of the European Union, which obviously goes well beyond uh, what we can offer in the overall regional context uh, to, uh, to, uh, and what people desire to have in the overall context of the uh, Black Sea region, because there are countries and partners including in the Eastern Partnership, who do not want to go that far. So obviously there are things uh, in a comprehensive and deep cooperation that we can only do with those who really want to go that far, but we still need to focus and concentrate on what we can do with everyone in the Black Sea region. And obviously there are areas, and you've mentioned them, where we can still deepen this cooperation. Maritime security is one, working on subjects as migration is another one. So I don't think that we have exhausted the potential. But it is true that some of the things we do right now are relatively modest in comparison with with what the ambitions of Bulgaria and Romania might have been uh, in uh, 2007, but this is of course uh, to a very great extent uh, due to circumstances and developments uh, beyond the control at that time of the European Union. Still I can ensure you that the European Union remains firmly committed to uh, working on the Black Sea, uh, um, 
uh, on the Black Sea Synergy Initiative, we're precisely discussing how one can reboost this initiative right now, what the firm potential is. We will continue to work on this in very close cooperation, in particular with Bulgaria and Romania as our members in the region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I have three points, very short. One is responding to uh, what Ivailo has mentioned, you know, with the Bucharest summit, NATO summit. Actually, it was those who wanted not to offer MAP to Ukraine and uh, <coughs> Georgia and Moldova who won the battle, and actually they promised membership to NATO, which for the Russians was even worse. And I wonder if offering them a membership action plan would have not been better under the circumstances. But history is history, so we cannot come back on that. The second thing is that uh, um, why a synergy and not a strategy? From the very beginning, you know, a synergy is lesser than a strategy. And that was offered, you know, immediately after. It was not a strategy, but a synergy, which means, you know, links, uh, platform uh, linking, some other things, and so on. So from the very beginning, it was conceived as a lesser thing than, than strategy, which was offered for other areas. Uh, for the Baltic, for instance, where the Russians are also present. And the third uh, observation is, I am very much uh, impressed by the optimism which is derived from the ignore, ignoring of the elephant in the room. That we can say, you know, that uh, everything is possible, we should start it slowly, we should continue, there are many things, but we ignore the elephant in the room, and the elephant in the room is Crimea, annexed illegally by Russia, and uh, the subsequent militarization of the peninsula, which is changing entirely the security environment in the area. If we ab make abstraction of this, I think you know everything is possible. But, but that's my personal opinion. I don't want to preclude. I invite uh, our colleagues who are around the table to uh, submit their questions, and our panelists are ready to respond. Thank you very much. No yellow, blue, or pink cards collected? Yes? May I say something? Do we have? About elephants. Ah, yes. Please. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Pashko. Uh, you know, but yes, elephant is very important. But it's necessary to take into consideration that in the Black Sea region there is a small country with conflicts, and they consider it as elephant. I mean, you know, but it's difficult to co compare how we can estimate elephant. Which one is more bad or more better? For instance, conflict, uh, the situation between Russia, Georgia, or situation between Armenia, Azerbaijan, or situation between Georgia, and so on, so on. And as I mentioned here, you know, but really, all conflict has different base, right? It is very difficult to find one solution for all conflict, but without any axiom, without any base, I think it is difficult to uh, solve the conflict, to find elephant, as you mentioned. For instance, there is Helsinki Treaty, right? And three main principles there. Peaceful solution of the conflicts, Nobody against of that, everybody uh, supports. Second one, it is territorial integrity of the countries. And the third one, right of nations for self-definition. And let's imagine, without any precondition, let's apply directly right of nations for self-definition. What will be happened in the world? It will bring to collapse of the world, because immediately it will appeared a lot of small country, and all of them will have war with neighbors. And so it's clear that directly to apply it, right of, I'm not against uh, right of nation for self-definition, but directly applied, it's really almost impossible. But let's assume another principle, territorial integrity. And in the frame of territorial integrity, we can realize any rights of any nations as a self definition. Of course, it's a question, it's an issue for discussion. 
it's my maybe personal uh, point of view and which is uh, I'm observing in PubSec because in all assembly, you know, but uh, there's a battle between countries, they accuse each other, but uh, I don't know, fortunately or unfortunately, why economic organization, it is prohibited to discuss conflict and take any decision, but in declaration, for instance, recently, it was taking place in um, Kiev, it was uh, announced in declaration that territorial integrity and occupied territory should be liberated. That principle was reflected in declaration. It was, it, of course, it was a lot of discussion, a lot of country, some country was against of that, but it was adopted. And so the world should think, but how we have to find the base element for finding solution for conflict? Because our prosperity depends on uh, depends on uh, finding solution. I can give you a very small example. Baku, Tbilisi, Jehan, the main pipe, uh, oil pipeline, right? It was spent about three billion US dollar. But why? Because it was a problem between Azerbaijan and Azerbaijan, but the shortest way was through Armenia. But if it would be happened, I mean through Armenia, maybe we, did not spend three, four billion dollars, just only one billion. It's very important for small countries. Thank you. I'm sure that the banks would be happier uh, collecting rates for uh, three billion than for one billion. <laughs> but that's a different story. So please, sir. Well, I just wanted to respond uh, to what you said, uh, because I don't know whether you were addressing my statement when you said that people are saying that everything is possible uh, in the region. In my opinion, I said precisely the opposite. What I did say is that the sort of grand design that people may, might have had in mind with regard uh, uh, to a Black Sea strategy in 2007 was severely curtailed. Uh, but what happened in, uh, in, uh, in Crimea, and of course I did say that because we do not recognize and will not recognize the illegal annexation, these sort of grand designs and this cooperation in Crimea is not possible. So what I did say, and you, I, I did refer to the, uh, to the principles we have, which basically says, as you know, that we can only have a substantial change in our relationship with Russia uh, once um, Minsk, to start with that, is fully implemented. And, in the, in, and of course, in the Black Sea uh, context, Crimea has a, a key role uh, of its own. I did say the only thing we can do is certain selective engagement in areas which which are of direct advantage to people to people and in areas where we can work locally, where it is in our own interest. And, and that is precisely what we're also doing in the Northern Dimension. And that is the very reason why what we can do in the framework of the Black Sea Synergy right now, even if we want to reboost it, is relatively modest. But things like <coughs> environmental protection, uh, uh, blue, uh, blue Sea, uh, working on maritime security, working in the field of migration are areas where it is potentially also in our own interest uh, to cooperate, including with difficult partners in the region. So that is my line, and I think that is our line. There are a limited number of things that we can do, but the sort of more ambitious uh, things that we might have hoped to do in the framework of a strategy are not possible uh, because of the situation since 2014. Okay, I am entirely in agreement that we should try. <laughs> but you know, I am a, an optimist well-informed, which is closer to a pessimist in this respect. <laughs> but other than that, you know, I think that uh, uh, if there are uh, questions, because uh, it would be a, a bit odd that we start a discussion amongst ourselves instead of uh, bringing our colleagues into the discussion. So, no questions, so yes, Invalo. Thank you, Jan. It's not about a question, but uh, I mean, the last session of a very interesting conference is uh, not easy to manage, <laughs> I understand. And maybe many that's why we were invited to, yes. to do it. <laughs> um, just uh, uh, two comments on uh, what you and what uh, Ambassador Harting just, uh, just said. Uh, uh, First, uh, there is an elephant in the room, obviously. Uh, I'm not sure whether the elephant in the room is the annexation of Crimea or these are the relations with Russia in general. Uh, any case, we have to deal with that. 
but uh, in the jungle there are more animals. So we cannot focus only on one thing, which is even being the elephant in the room. There are many other things that cannot wait, because otherwise the other uh, the, the fauna in the jungle is going to extinguish uh, the time we are concentrating on one of its uh, uh, species. Uh, so uh, I really think that uh, Koimia is a sophisticated issue. I personally don't have an idea how this is going to be solved in a very recent future, but I'm sure that there is a basis for cooperation which is inclusive on a number of other issues. I'm sure that on the annexation of Koimia we are not going to find any uh, common uh, strategy or whatsoever with, uh, with the, uh, within the Black Sea region. Uh, but you have plenty of other things. And uh, that's why the elephant is there, but uh, we have to focus on the other as uh, very good uh, people understanding that uh, the diversity is uh, bigger than the elephant. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have to, to, to focus on the other species also. And one uh, sentence on what Ambassador Harting uh, just said. I absolutely agree that the European Commission is, uh, is doing its best, and we have on the table the Black Sea Synergy, we have the Eastern Partnership. Uh, both have differences, and I understand although it was uh, difficult at the time to explain exactly what are the differences between the two initiatives. The thing is that uh, I believe that we don't need many initiatives, but we need to streamline what we have. Uh, to be clear with what countries we are going on bilateral basis and where the cooperation could go to, to, to a different extent and where we have a common denominator. For me, it has to be inclusive for everybody in order not to create uh, um, tensions that are not needed and to see what we can do uh, in terms of regional cooperation. Uh, that's, that's the thing. I mean, you can call it the way you want. <laughs> you want. I personally think that we... Uh, enough would be to have one initiative, regional initiative. We can call it strategy, dimension, whatsoever, uh, in the Black Sea, where we try to look for actions, for common actions, like PAPSEC and like uh, BSEC is doing, uh, for, of, uh, of common interest. And, and, uh, and this is as simple as that. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, anything else? Yes. You saved the day. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Just one thing with regard to the conflict in eastern Ukraine. You will recall that last September, President Putin, he made a proposal in regard to the possible deployment of UN peacekeepers along the contact line. Now, that was somewhat understandably rejected by the Ukraine as an attempt to legalize Russia's proxies and freeze the conflict. Now, Obviously, there would be significant obstacles to implementing that particular proposal. Does the panel see any positive potential in that um, proposal? Who would like to? I could. Yeah, please. I could uh, try on that. Uh, uh, I think you, you answered yourself in your question. I mean, if you send uh, peacekeepers in the eastern part of Ukraine, uh, you s practically settle another frozen conflict. Uh, not that we have too many chances uh, to close this conflict without uh, freezing it, uh, but uh, you can, I mean, uh, in uh, the eastern part of, of Ukraine, you have plenty of issues related uh, with uh, the sovereignty. I mean, who is paying pensions, for example? Uh, who is uh, paying taxes there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, if you try to solve this just by sending peacekeepers, um, I'm afraid the problem is going to, to not to be solved, but rather to create a separate entity, which is going to be like Transnistria or uh, uh, Nagorno Karabakh or another frozen conflict in the region. That's why I, I really don't think that it's a good idea to send peacekeepers. I mean, peacekeepers is not enough to. Uh, solve the, the, the problems with sovereignty and, and administrative capacity in the region. Uh, the way I uh, understand uh, the ongoing discussion, 
I mean, basically, if what seemed to be the original uh, uh, proposal by President Putin would have been followed through, it would have basically been uh, um, uh, um, a stabilization of the conflict along the contact line, which is clearly not, which would, which would freeze it exactly in the manner that Minister Kalfin said. And this is, uh, well, it is understandable that this, in any case, is an option that is unacceptable to the Ukrainian side. Uh, if what we are speaking about is an international presence, uh, which should help to realize the sequence that was agreed in Minsk, that is to say to start with uh, the ceasefire, which is still lacking after all these months and years that we've, uh, that we've seen these efforts ongoing, and then leading to a political process that makes these uh, uh, local elections possible and then allows for the return of the uh, territory in eastern Ukraine under the control of the Ukrainian government in Kiev and the, return, uh, the, the control over the international border. That that obviously would be something different. I understand that the, this is precisely the subject also of the discussions that are ongoing uh, between uh, um, Mr. Surkov and, uh, and, 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 and Ambassador Folka and others. And I think that uh, these efforts have not yet concluded, but it is clear that um, uh, for such a peacekeeping operation uh, to work, uh, it would have to go far beyond the concept of simply freezing the situation. It's correct, um, but this is, uh, you know, it's a very complex conflict which has one part, which is Crimea, which is not promising, you know, uh, any resolution soon, and the other one, which is, uh, again, very complicated. Um, on the one hand, you know, if you ask Russia to really fulfill completely the means thing, they will probably consider that this is beyond their dignity. And uh, therefore, you know, it's very difficult to, uh, it will be a position in which uh, each country will dug in and then, you know, there is no way further. Let's hope that such openings, you know, will bring some uh, results. So. Anybody else? Please. You want? Very Please. Short. Very short. You know, but for, for any solution, it is necessary to continue dialogue. Without dialogue, it is very difficult to find any solution. And all conflicts which today are existing in the Black Sea region, the, it is a multi-parametrical conflict. There is not there doesn't exist any one step if we'll do that step and the problem will be solved. No, it should be dialogue. I think it will take a long time, but we have to follow the dialogue because without dialogue, no solution and no end. Thank you. It's correct. It's correct. Um, yes, please. I want to underline these last words. There is no alternative uh, to a dialogue. And we have to keep this dialogue open, and, uh, and we cannot have peace and development in Europe against Russian. We have to find a dialogue with Russian and solutions with them. And we have to separate the two conflicts. There is one side is the Crimea, and one is the Eastern Ukraine. But the Eastern Ukraine conflict is not so easy, because, as you know, maybe better than me, uh, that there are different um, soldiers, a kind of soldiers. There are private armies from oligarchs. There are from the organized crime uh, private armies. There are um, special uh, unknown forces as from, from the neighbor country. There are from the eastern Ukraine, they are from the Ukraine. So on both sides, there are different military interests. And that is not so easy for a ceasefire and for the Minsk protocol to say to both sides, now we make ceasefire and we will control that. Because there are always some specific, and I remember in the Bosnian war, we had those that some, some persons had private armies with 3,000 uh, or till 6,000 persons. He was the, the boss of a cooperative, an uh, agricultural cooperative with a big private, uh, private army. And such armies we have there also. And this makes it so complicated. And uh, 
And, uh, and I think both sides are not always responsible when the ceasefire is broken. And that means we need longer priests for, this, uh, for all those dialogues which is necessary. And yes, at the end, there must be the completely control of Eastern Ukraine under the government and, uh, and, uh, and the international border. But the way there is a long way. Mr. Chair. Two questions over there. Yeah. Or one here. Yeah, then one small remark just from Lithuanian side. We are hearing two sides, Ukrainian and Russia, two sides. You know, there is no two sides. There's Russia aggression against Ukrainian states. And we should always have in mind that, you know. And Russia is using this uh, conflict to make a Ukraine failed state. It's absolutely understandable from Russia's side. We are doing that. And of course, the biggest question for, for, for us, for European Union, of course, to think about the future of EAP, Eastern Partnership Policy. And the question is, does Russia have an informal veto power on a new enlargement to Eastern Europe? So if it could be, could you comment ab about it? I mean, do you feel that informal veto power or are we, uh, capable EU sometimes in uh, 10, 20 years to propose to Eastern Partnership countries real membership perspective. Thank you. Something you, there is also another. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it is not a question, a uh, short comment, and comes in the line of your under uh, regarding the, the Crimea. It is very clear for everybody that after annexation of Crimea in 2014 by the Russia geopolitical vacancy was over in this region. After that, followed the massive militarization such as after the big military exercise, Caucasus 2016, General Valery Gerasimov, the chief of general staff of uh, Russia, uh, had, has the arrogance to declare that Russia covers all the Black Sea Basin and has the capacity to strike all targets starting from the movement from the ports of this location. Actually, the situation uh, in Black Sea Basin, in Black Sea Zone, is, let's say, complex at least. And I'm wondering about the position of Turkey because um, the I don't understand the last movement of the Turkey. The biggest issue from my point of view is security in this area. And we have also frozen conflicts in Georgia starting 2008 and probably in Ukraine because this is a way of doing for Russia. The solution is, according to my understanding, to implement decision taken taken at Warsaw summit in 2016 in terms of defense. Speaking about the defense, I think a much cooperation between Bulgaria and Romania is necessary to not duplicate military equipment because smart defense meet, means spend of money in a smart mode, not spend much money. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much. Somebody would like to take up these two questions. Ivailo. Thank you. Maybe the first, uh, uh, the our colleague from Lithuania asked about uh, some veto from Russia to the EU enlargement. I think this is absurd. Uh, but uh, uh, this is not, as they call it, in the pipeline. Because first, uh, uh, the countries, the, the six countries in the Eastern Partnership, uh, maybe some of them are willing, at least the, poli the political leaders are saying that they're very much willing to join the European Union one day. Some others uh, even don't think about that. So I, I wouldn't uh, say that the common denominator for the Eastern Partnership is a prospective membership in the European Union. And then in the European Union, I'm afraid there is no uh, huge enthusiasm to open the track for accession to this uh, part, and this is regardless of Russia. 
So I think that uh, issues are totally different and Russia has nothing to do with that, but uh, I would be uh, very much uh, surprised if uh, uh, one day Russia imagines that uh, they can uh, influence the, the own decisions of the European Union. Very short. I am optimist, you know, but uh, <laughs> I'd like to comment uh, uh, about situation in Syria or with Turkey, you know, but I'm optimist and the positive signal was announced two days ago. Russia, United States and Turkey. They announced that they support territorial integrity of Syria. And it means that there is some initial point from where we can move forward. It is a matter. When you do not have any point for moving, for movement, you know, but how you can move. So, but I am an optimist in this, but I think that starting from this base point, solution can be found. Thank you. Perhaps very briefly, of course, the subject of the European aspirations of the Eastern partners, those who have them, the three, I mean, uh, Eastern partners who want to get closer uh, to the European <coughs> Union was at the center of the discussions of the Brussels Eastern Partnership Summit. And what uh, member states of the European Union agreed on, as you know at the time, was that they repeated what was already said in Riga, that we acknowledge the European aspirations of these countries and that we welcome their European choice. But I don't think that there's consensus at this stage in the European Union to say more. On the other hand, we do think that the um, deep and comprehensive uh, free trade areas and the association agreements we have with three of these partners still require very substantive implementation and that there's a lot that can be done and that also that there's also a lot that can be done specifically with these countries because they have possibilities and ambitions and interests that go beyond those of the three others and I think that therefore the question of how to cooperate with these three countries bilaterally in the group of three uh, to make the implementation of these agreements possible is an agreement is, is something that we're looking into while at the same time we're of course interested in maintaining the <coughs> multilateral dimension of the Eastern Partnership as such, because we think that it's in the overall interest of the three most advanced partners that the other three, uh, the three with the greatest ambitions, I should say, that three others, uh, Belarus, Azerbaijan and Armenia are also participating. And inversely, we think that it's in the interest of these three countries that to, they're together in a grouping that may have ambitions to come closer to the European Union. Well, one aspect which in, I entirely agree with you, one aspect which is uh, different from the year 2000 is that uh, deep and comprehensive trade agreements right now are, are much more complex than the relationship established with the future members in the 2000s, including Romania and Bulgaria and other countries from the East. So I think you know that this is something which we sometimes we ignore or we do not pay too much attention to this because this is offering much more uh, to, to those countries than you know, we enjoyed when we were uh, in that stage uh, candidates. So I think you know, this is also something which could be played upon because some countries which are, do not have the ambition of joining would also benefit a lot through such a relationship. So, anybody else? That's it. Uh, I would only con conclude by saying that uh, I would be in favor after the, this discussion, I would be in favor of removing all China from the room or from the jungle, just in case. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear panelists, for your encompassing presentations. Thank you, colleagues, for the debate. Please stay for 10 more minutes. First, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I have the pleasure to give the floor to Mr. Biosch for a presentation of the next IPC, CFSP, CSDP, as our Austrian friends are due to hold the presidency of the Council of the EU. Please, Mr. Biosch, you have the floor. Thank you, Mrs. Chair. In behalf of the Austrian Parliament, I would uh, like, as the head of our delegation and as the chair of our Defence Committee, to thank the colleagues of Bulgaria for the hospitality and the perfect organisation of this uh, conference. Our country will be the next presidency in the second half of 2018. And uh, so lassen Sie mich meine. So I shall. 
continue in my mother tongue. Um, so you can just get used to the Austrian sound of the German language. On October 11th and 12th, we will have the next interparliamentary conference in Vienna. You're all very cordially invited. And I can tell you that the Austrians will take up the most important issues that we've discussed during the three days in Sofia, and we will take them off, uh, take them up and further develop them in a very constructive way. Apart from the focal issues of the presidency, which are of course formulated by the federal government, and uh, we will deal with the uh, major EU issues like the Brexit or the protection of external borders or currency, monetary issues, social political issues. This will be accompanied by elements and aspects of uh, security policy. For us Austrians, it will be the Western Balkans, which we consider extremely important, but it will also be the further development of PESCO. You know that our Republic decided to participate in PESCO, despite the fact that we are a neutral Republic, we're not a member of NATO, but we still want to further contribute in terms of peace and stability and security in Europe. So I consider it very important that not only we look at the securing of our external borders, the hybrid threats, but also the ability to act with respect to the capacities that relate to our military forces and that we continue to further develop these capacities. Ladies and gentlemen, we will deal with all these issues. We will put them on the agenda in the form of a constructive dialogue. And we hope to see you all in Vienna in October. After my uh, statement, our delegation has to leave because the airplane for Vienna will not wait. But I want to say this. The declaration as presented by the presidency is a declaration we will agree with. Thank you for your efforts to bring about a compromise. And we will, of course, share and uh, take up all the contents that we find in the declaration. So, thank you all. In Vienna, goodbye. Thank you, Mr. Bosch. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I would like to express my gratitude to all for your good work to make this conference a meaningful and valuable event. As a result of these efforts, we have a final document from the conference, statement of the heads of delegations, which carries out the political messages that we as parliamentarians would like to convey for the direction of the European Union policies with a view of the next decade and beyond. By reaching consensus on the statement, we all also want to send a clear message that common perspective is indeed possible for the Union on the complicated issues that we are facing, that are facing our community of nations. I'm certain that this trend will continue in the framework of the Austrian presidency uh, and would like to wish them great success in this. And I think we here deserve some applauses. Thank you for the work and safe journey back home. And now, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to give the floor to my esteemed colleague and friend, Mr. Popov, for closing remarks. Thank you, Gemma. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll try to be short. Uh, but let's to mention this. It is an absolute privilege for me to make the final remarks of the IPC. The conference is one of the largest event in scope during the Bulgarian presidency of the EU Council. We had the pleasure and the challenge to host more than 200 people, parliamentarians, observers, and staff. I value very highly the fact that we have a very beneficial and much needed discussion as a leaders, showing a strategic vision, looking deep into the subject and far in the future. The implementation and adaptation of the 
European Union global strategy for a common foreign and security policy is extremely important. We must be at the forefront of the new. And when a legislative support is needed to have the potential and the attitude to provide it. We, the parliamentarians of the member states, have to search for and find common solutions to common problems. We made it clear that a priority of the Bulgarian presidency is to pursue an active policy towards the countries of the Western Balkans. We think that their efforts for full membership in the European Union and NATO deserve support. Let me reiterate once again our message. They have their places in the European family reserved. But it depends when they will take the, those places. It is important for our region and for Europe as whole. We have had a deep debate on very important matters of the CFSP and CSDP. The EU is taking serious steps to strengthen its policy and the European defense potential, implementing, of course, our global strategy. This should lead us to the development of the EU defense capabilities. The strategic membership with NATO and the work of EU cooperation should continue. I believe that the conference was productive and has achieved its goals. It provided a framework for exchange of information and, of course, the best practices. We are better informed when carrying out our respective roles in this policy area. A big word of thank you goes, of course, to the High Representative Mrs. Mogherini and to the all panelists for their valuable contribution and support to the discussion. I would also like to thank you to the staff organizing the conference. To our colleagues from Troika, they already left, but I would like to thank you to Estonians for their understanding and support, and to our colleagues to, from Austria, let wish them all the best and very successful next IPC. And finally, to all participants and observers, thank you for coming and for your con contribution. I hope that your stay was professionally beneficial and personally pleasant. Have a safe trip back home and best of success in your important endeavors. With these last words, I close this conference. <coughs>